Welcome to chapter 10, Pricing the Product. This is a shorter slide deck, this chapter, because a lot of the core content, a lot of the key content is contained in the textbook and it's a feature set of diagrams, models, and really hard to talk over setups. So this is a chapter where you really need to be reading and looking at the chapter and looking at the textbook chapter because when we're talking about demand curves and supply curves, it's a lot easier if you've got the body of work beside you, the diagram in front of you, and working over it through the text yourself at your own pace, rather than having me briefly talk about it. And usually most people are walking away confused. What we are going to focus on here is the marketing aspect of pricing. Now, if you've come from economics or accounting, you probably have a different view of how to set a price and that is a valid view. In marketing, one of the critical elements is to be thinking about price, not just from what it does as an economic indicator, not just from what it does in terms of revenue for the firm, but what you can use it for to make it fit with the rest of the marketing mix. And we're gonna talk about a couple of pricing strategies here that are not related in any way, shape or form to rational decision-making or calculative approaches. These pricing strategies are about making use of consumer and consumer behavior. So to kick this off, we are near the end of the creation of the value proposition. When we think about marketing and we look at the marketing definition, we talk about create, communicate, deliver, and exchange. Price is about the exchange component and if you think about marketing and the marketing mix as a sequence, a sequence of events, in the creation of the product, you are going to go and make an offer, make that offer fit the needs of the market. As part of that creation, the price you set determines the value people are going to feel that they're getting from their offer. So the offering that has value Value in this sense is going to come through pricing, but the creation of the value proposition is also a combination of price and product. You will then go on and communicate this valued and valuable offer, and then you'll be responsible for delivering it. So price and product work together really closely here. We've got two types of, when we're talking about price, we're talking about monetary price, and when we're talking about non-monetary price, there's a key facet here of a lot of marketers, particularly those with economics and accounting backgrounds, and I'm sorry if I feel like I'm leaning on you guys for this, but as a crew, you are taught to think about the money and think about the impact of dollar signs. As marketers, we're taught to think about, well, what are the other facets involved here? What are the non-monetary costs? What is the factor, what is the opportunity cost that we are asking someone to invest in buying into our product? So we need to think not just in terms of what is the currency value that we're going to put on this product, but what are the opportunity costs that this product will invoke? And in return, what does the customer get back as value? Because the price has to be a good measure of the value that the customer is going to get from that desired product. And to make it work, the customer needs to feel that they're getting more value than they are expending in costs. So we talk about the pricing process. It's interesting, again, here what we're looking at and what we've got inside this chapter. We're going to have a whole series of different ways of what your objectives are, how to set your objectives. The whole demand estimation is a section I'm pushing you back to the textbook to read and review. It's very calculative and I like it for its calculative nature, but it's much easier to get you to read than to talk over. Then we look at the costs and one of the critical elements that goes wrong for a lot of people in pricing is that we start thinking about costs from our side not, uh, and that is a critical and important part, 
but the customer doesn't care. We should be using pricing as a consumer tool, as a tool to communicate with the consumer. So remember, the marketing mix is about creating something that the consumer values. And yes, cost will be present, but cost shouldn't be a facet that the consumer is interested in. We have the pricing environment, the picking a pricing strategy, and then building your tactics. The pricing strategies and the pricing objectives should relate. That's just one of those requirements. So let's talk pricing objectives. Now, we have five main objectives. It's kind of interesting that profit has a bad reputation and profit's got a bad name, even amongst commerce students. But profit's idea is that profit basically is the survival of the organization. It's, your pricing is set to ensure that you are there again tomorrow. Sales pricing objectives are based around increasing market share with the intention that owning more, selling more and owning more customers means more money down the track, more people's problems are being solved, and you'll still be in business longer. Customer satisfaction is about setting a price that makes the customer happy. And this is a really critical area element here is there is a real downward trending pressure in a lot of the ways we think about marketing and pricing to make things cheaper. But cheaper doesn't always mean happier customers. There is a role for expensive and there is a value that the customer will feel in paying a premium for a product that might be cheap to produce, you might be making a huge per unit margin profit here. And the customer is really, really happy because the customer is getting the price meeting the psychological needs. They want, you go back to Maslow hierarchy of needs, they're looking at self-actualization needs, they want to spend, they want to buy a luxury because they're worth it and they want to spend a lot of money on a thing to reward themselves for being good people. So your customer satisfaction comes from making certain that you're actually able to meet that market's needs through the way you price. And that can be priced low and that can be priced high. Competition, uh, pricing objectives are basically you are kind of offshoring, offselling your um, pricing to your rivals. I don't like it as an approach. I think it's lazy. But also I think it's lazy because it's not looking at price as an active and integral part of the marketing mix. It's saying price is just a, you know, a not really important part. But then again, if you're copying your opponent's product design, you might as well copy their price and their promotion. Heck, you might as well be them. The last one is image enhancement. Again, this links back to customer satisfaction. Price communicates a sense of value. And particularly having services where it's difficult to work out whether in fact the accredence service is really difficult to calculate what it was worth. But if you spent a lot of money on a credence service, you're going to tell yourself that that was a good experience and a good service because it has to be a good service because you spent a lot of money on it. It's a wonderful psychological hack. We should use it more. So, brief mention of costs, variable costs and fixed costs. Again, costs, it's an important thing to understand here. This is the cost from the organization side. This is not something the customer cares about. What we are interested in as a marketer is ensuring that when we start thinking about pricing based on various facets, we ensure that we think about what the costs that are incurred by the consumer are in the way we design our pricing. We use the types of costs that we're going to incur to make certain that we're actually making enough money to keep going and keep surviving. But the variable costs and fixed costs should never come into a sales pitch. There should never be a question of how is the consumer going to react to this price? What pricing strategy we're going to use? They, these should be factors to consider, but you shouldn't just go and limit yourself based on, well, we've, we've made break even, we should stop now, when that break even price may not meet the needs of the customer. It might be too low for the customer. 
All right, the break-even analysis. Uh, it's always embarrassing for me to teach this particular slide because I used to work for a firm where the reason we hit the wall is uh, we completely messed up our break-even analysis. We costed, we did price based on costing of our product and we didn't factor in the total costs of running the organization. So we could make a profit per unit but we weren't factoring, successfully factoring in what it was costing to keep the office open and the salaries. So we kind of messed that up. So the break-even analysis, you want to be working out the total costs. And for those of you who are going to be doing individual consulting, contracting, or going to art, being a musician, an artist, it's not just your resources. And this is one of the things, art um, and musicians, to some extent, but particularly artists, will look at a piece of paper and go, well, that's, you know, ink. It took me two hours to do that. So it's two hours, it was my time, it was the ink, it was the canvas, it was... And then you'll miss the whole point of, well, those, there's the rent and there's the food and there's every other cost you need to cover to continue being an artist. So your calculations there are really important. This has been the downfall. I've seen a lot of Kickstarters lately that have made significant mistakes on their break-even analysis, where their revenue and costs weren't, they didn't calculate their total costs properly. So really, this is probably the most critical error that you can make as a marketer, is to not have the full maths underpinning this. And the reality is, if it's going to cost you a per unit cost that is going to be greater than what you think the market will bear in terms of buying your product, it's not a good product to pursue. So you can also have this, when we talk about marketing strategy, one of the facets in this is, yes, you need to meet the needs of the market, but you also need to be able to continue meeting the needs of the market. It's not actually ethical to solve their problem, then go broke and go away. Because you've given them the taste of a solution, then you've taken it away from them. So the ethicality is actually in successfully calculating enough profit so that you can be there again when the customer needs you again. All right, the pricing environment. Welcome back to seeing some of the things you might remember from PEST and SWOT and segmentation, targeting, and consumer behavior. This is why marketing is cyclical. We loop back. This is why I ask you to keep your notes and get into the habit of keeping the material that you've gathered. Because when we're looking at the pricing environment, we're looking at, well, what will the consumer market bear? So what will our segment want as a price? What are we up against for competition? And what does that mean for our pricing? And what's the economy like? What does that mean for the amount of discretionary income that's available to be spent on our products? So you need to be looking at these as factors, and they, these factors were raised in SWOT. But also, when you're doing a calculation in the pricing environment, you may need to go back and redo your SWOT or PEST analysis based on the new information here and see what impact that has. So it's okay to have a nonlinear process. It's okay to go back and revise previous. Now, pricing strategy decisions. Let's talk here, and we're going to go through each of these over in a bit of detail. But we really want to flag two points here. Costs, competition, and even demand are organization-centric views of price. Customer needs and product pricing are consumer-centric views of price. It's worth thinking really seriously about using all of the options. So you can calculate on your costs, you can compare against your competition, and comparison against competition then lets you do things involving positioning. You can look at the demand and then you can look at, okay, with these facets in mind and the price we've set, 
Are we meeting the customer's needs? So cost-based calculation is the equations and the information uh, in the textbook. This is a read the manual moment. What I want to talk here is about the marketer's perspective. When we go and calculate based on costs, we are leaving some marketing tools on the shelf. We're not considering positioning. We're not looking at, well, where does our price at production cost plus 15%, what's that price in, in contrast to the other people who are in the market? What's that price say about our brand image? And where are we at in the product life cycle? So cost-based calculation, it's a good starting point. I don't ever want to dismiss it because it's critically important to make certain that you are in fact covering your costs. But it's not the best marketing technique that's available for pricing. I will also say that it's worth considering that whilst you're thinking about this probably as monetary costs, also figure out time cost. Figure out some of the psychological and social prices that are attached to this and make certain that you also check those pricing in terms of costs and are you covering the amount of time. If it's going to be the creation of this product is going to take you 12 hours, Will the amount of money that you're going to get for this cover the amount of time that you're going to be engaged in this? Time-based pricing, demand-based pricing. Look, this is actually, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done on this in terms of price uh, variation, automated pricing and demand pricing. There are two marketing techniques that use demand, yield management and demarketing. Demarketing is where you go and use your price to get rid of customers. And if you're blinking at this moment going, wait, what? There are customers you don't want. There are customers who are awkward, they're expensive, they cost you more than you get back. But there are also customers who are showing up when the service is at a peak. So if you can raise the price to the point that it's a price pain threshold for them, but lower encourage them to use the lower pricing at a different time. So we have peak and on-peak demand, we have off-peak travel, we have pricing spikes around demand for airlines because we know that on a long weekend, the Friday afternoon, flight out of Canberra goes through the roof because everybody's jumping down for a three-day break. So we want to encourage people to take off on Friday morning, Thursday night, to take some strain off the uh, capacity, but also we want to make certain that the people who we can crank up the price on the Friday afternoon capacity because the people who are desperate will pay the money and rather the people who feel that it's worth that price will also feel that they got out and got a decent price for it. Yield management, we also see this in terms of last minute demand. The existence of whatif.com and lastminute.com also show you the price based on, well, it's better to have some money for the, the service. So there's also that last minute discounting. Again, think from, look at this from the calculative economic accounting approach, but think of it from a marketer's approach. What can we do with this to communicate to the market. What can our price do for doing demand-based pricing? What can we do to talk to the market? Price based on competition. Uh, this can either be incredibly lazy or this can be part of, an integral part of a positioning strategy. So if you know your competitor's price, and usually it's not too hard to figure that out. If you're pricing to match, then it's really you are saying we are just like our, we are a choice just like the other. If you get a price to match, there's a technique here in terms of there's a marketing strategic technique about cost leadership where you want to make certain your production costs are lower than your opponent's production costs so that this pair of you selling the same product for the same price, you have the higher profit so you do better. 
Pricing below is a strategic attack. You can use this as a positioning strategy to be the cheaper alternative. You can look at you can say, well, we can produce this at a lower quality for less price, at, less, at a lower cost, because we're going to take some of the quality off. We will aggressively position in as the budget alternative. We'll price below our competitor and we'll position below our competitor. We will be Ryanair, we will be Tiger Airways, we will be the cheap alternative. Or you can come back out and price above. Look at your competition and go, okay, nice competition. Yeah, this is what the average price is, so $1,500 for a phone, I will come in at 4500 now, I only need to sell one phone for every three phones my opponent sells, but I only want to sell one phone for every three phones my opponent sells. In fact, I want to go the other way around. I want to be $6,000 for a phone, and that phone to have gold trim, and that phone to have ludicrous, overt, ostentatious quality indicators on it of price and bling. Because you're going to come in and say, you are the best brand. You are the elite brand. You are targeting a small niche group of opinion leaders and people with more money. And they've got common sense. Because these are people that need to set themselves out from the market. They need to be distinct and they need to be distinguished. You are looking at a luxury object that you are selling to a luxury market with a massive price gap above the nearest rival. And it works, you can do this. This is how art works. This is how you can set, pre you can even do this in terms of thinking of yourself as a competitor. You can offer a basic unit price. So entry to a festival, $175. Entry to the VIP part of the festival, add another $75 on. Entry to the VIP, VIP lounge, the special, special lounge, $400. 175 for the base entry, $400 for the top entry. You are pricing above yourself, you're treating yourself as a competitor, but you're offering a premium to go with that limited edition pricing. So again, a lot of the thinking that you come across in marketing is about the idea of undercutting your opponent. I love the idea of overcutting your opponent. Coming into the market with a strong brand, a high, quality, a high perceived quality on your product, and a price that says, darling, I'm fabulous. Because that's who you're after. You're after the you know, people who've got the money and want to distinguish themselves. So price above is a legitimate approach. It's also one of the most fun things you can do in marketing. All right, the pricing based on customer needs. Now, this is talked about in the book as the everyday low pricing, the promise of ultimate value to customers. But the promise of value needs to be really really comprehensively thought about here. The core product is the value offer. If you are buying a product to distinguish you from the others, you are buying a product to make you special, to hit the top of the self-actualization pyramid, you want to be the one standing at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs because you've got everything else covered. That price must offer you something of value. It's got to be something that you are actually, when you pay this, you feel that, yes, this was good. So sometimes it's cheap. Sometimes it's the bargain. Sometimes we trigger the survival traits. You know, you've got a bargain. You've got a deal. Your hunter-gatherer instinct has kicked over. You feel really happy about it because you know, you've done the right thing. You're a smart shopper. Other times it's a premium because you're worth it. You've spent. You've dropped Two grand, two thousand dollars on a jacket because it's incredibly pretty and you're worth it. You're going to wear it a dozen times, possibly, maybe three times. Maybe you'll wear it once, but you'll feel that it was worth it and the money was worth it because it's a special day, it's a special occasion. I'm worth it. See also pricing for weddings. All right. One of the other pricing strategies that exists is the new product pricing. Again, this is this ties back to 
the use of strategy rather than calculation. When you introduce a product and you're thinking about the product lifecycle and you're thinking about where your product is there, you have a choice. You can come in at a premium because you know that innovators are cashed up, have discretionary income and like to spend a bit of money. Being first isn't just enough. It's being first with wealth to display. These are the people who camp out for five days for the new iPhone because they can afford to spend five days sitting in a deck chair waiting to buy a consumer good at the accelerated and um, enhanced price that all new products come out at. Alternatively, if you are coming into a market that is already crowded, so you are a new product entrant in an existing market, you may want to go in with the penetration pricing to try and price below your competitor to build your market share and swipe and change the dynamics of the market. Swipe customers, change the dynamics of the market. Or you might want to come out on a trial price to get people started. Trial prices are really dangerous because what you're doing is that you're establishing in the mind of the consumer the value of your, pri your product. And if you think about the number of magazines that come out with $9.99 for the first issue, then $19.99 for every issue thereafter, they've already told you that the first issue is only worth 10 bucks. You're better off coming off at $19 for the first issue and $9.95 for the next, for the remaining issues, because the people who are interested in what your product's got to offer will buy that first and then feel that they're getting a deal because, well, this trial price of expensive suddenly became much cheaper now I've committed to it. So you're looking at this, again, from a perspective of what are the psychological factors that will kick into gear based on what you do with your trial pricing. So think as a marketer, not necessarily just as a numbers person. Distribution-based pricing, all right, this is what we call the curse of the internet. We have the total price concept, which the chapter will have talked about, and it really comes into its own here. This is where you go to eBay and you ask to sort by price and postage first. And you see that if you would sorted by price first, there is this magnificent deal where you're only going to pay a dollar for the iPad, and the shipping is $11,000. It's a con. Yes, it's a con. It's a brilliant con. Because if we get you to trigger only on your ref your reference price only on the cost of the product, only on the price of the product, and your reference price kicks into gear, then you're not looking at the total cost. However, if we get if you look at the shipping plus the price of the product, that might exceed your referent cost and your referent internal price of what's good value for the product itself. And particularly this is why like this is almost the curse of Amazon, but this is basically where you're looking at the different prices that are on the screen here. The freight absorption pricing is uh, eBay's even got a button for it, the free shipping price. The shipping isn't free, the shipping's embedded. The question is, does the embedding of the shipping make it actually worth, does your reference price come across and you look and go, yeah, that's a decent price. Most of the time on the internet, you're looking at uh, the free on board, the, you are responsible for the cost of the product's transport, which is where you end up with the situations of, you were going to buy that t-shirt from that website, the t-shirt was not $9, which was a good price for a shirt, and the shipping was $69, and you're like, no. And even when you stacked in 20 other shirts, you were still at, that's a ludicrous price for shipping, I'm not buying it. So total price concept really does impact when distribution pricing comes in as an overt element that you see. It's also worth noting that when you buy from a store, you're buying freight absorption pricing because the seller has embedded the cost of shipping to their store into the price that they're selling. All right, so I've mentioned the internal reference prices. This is a psychological issue. 
price quality inference, internal reference price, and buying price, buyers price perceptions, expectations. These are critical elements of consumer behavior in pricing. And what you're really looking at here is that where a referent price exists is that you have a, a number in your head that says, this is what I will expect to pay, and this is what I think is a reasonable price to pay. The internal reference price, therefore, gets to trigger that sense of expensive, cheap. Now, if your internal reference price for an object is $30, and you see it for 10 you will also trigger the, that's too far removed. What's wrong with this product? This isn't a bargain, there's something wrong with the product. If it's 30 and you see it priced at 90 you're going to simultaneously trigger the, that's really expensive, but you also have a mild curiosity of, well, what makes that worth three times? And your internal reference price might actually be able to trigger the luxury trigger. So we all know, you know, price of a car is around 25, 30,000, yeah. You pay 15,000 for a car, you know you're not getting a great car. You pay 150,000 for a car, that thing's gonna be sweet. Because we know we've got reference pricing. And when we're dealing with it, it's a learned behavior and it's a modified behavior. It's also a behavior if you can extract this through market research, you can learn this through market research, then you can use it for price positioning. The price quality inference is a wonderful bug we have as humans. If it's expensive, it has to be good. That's basically, if it's cheap, it can't be good. So there are certain points where your product has to exceed a reference price threshold in order for it to maintain its perceived quality and its actual quality. You go to a restaurant and the place is tricked out with silverware, there's cut crystal, there's glass, there's a live string quartet in the corner, and the prices are all in single digits. You're looking at five bucks for an entree and ten for a main. You're seeing they're going, everything's wrong. What, what, how? How is this happening? What's going on here? You go to the same restaurant and you add two zeros to the end, or add a zero to the end, and it's fifty bucks for an entree and a hundred for a main, but there's silverware everywhere. You're thinking, yep, this is worth it. These prices, yeah, this is going to be great. This is going to be amazing. This is going to be, you know, top of the line experience. So you will already modify your expectation based on what you paid for it. Also with pricing and services, as well as pricing and physical goods, price will give you a sense for what you should expect. And also the extent to which you are going to play along. If you've just dropped a couple of thousand dollars on a service, you're going to participate you're going to make it, you're going to go and want to feel like a smart customer and a good consumer, so you're going to go and look for the best possible ways of seeing this as a high value event. So you're going to play along with their expectation. These are the elements that are really, from a marketer's perspective, you want to be really conversant with this because they are very, very valuable tools, particularly for positioning, particularly for when we come to communication. The other uh, factors I'm going to point you to is have a look at the old even pricing and have a look at the price lining because these are techniques. And again, they're marketing techniques, they're worth observing. The last thing I want to mention is that price does come with legal and ethical considerations. And one of the facets I want to just draw your attention to is the price discrimination is actually something that. When we talk about international marketing, we talk about the grey market. A price discrimination, now we are referring to it as the Australia tax. For no apparent reason, if you're in Australia, software costs more, even if you can download that software directly from an American server. In fact, with the Adobe Photoshop, it was at the point that you could go to the airport, buy a ticket to the United States, fly to the US, buy a copy of Photoshop and fly back and still have change compared to what it was to buy a copy of Photoshop locally. And that straight up is price discrimination. Similar products to different consumers, different prices. 
There are legal concerns on price fixing. Basically, try not to, this is one of the things to be really considering when you're looking at something like pricing based on your competition is would it appear to be price fixing? Even if you weren't collaborating, you weren't discussing with your opponents, if you and your opponents are all roughly the same price and nobody ever seems to move, that would be grounds for people to be starting to perceive price fixing. The other area to watch for is the predatory pricing. If you've got the resources in the bank to go and try and bankrupt your opponent, these are price wars. This is something that was actually uh, Woolworths was doing quite openly in Queensland for an extended period is where they were in a shopping centre with a greengrocer, they would undercut that greengrocer. They'd look at whatever the greengrocer was offering on special and then offer it for a stupidly lower price. So if the greengrocer had bananas at $5 a kilo, Woolworths would put bananas up at 50 cents a kilo. It was an overt predatory pricing to try and bankrupt and drive the greengrocer out of the centre so that they got the dominant control of the fresh fruit and vegetable market. The legalities of all these things are basically such that even if the law exists, if your opponent's got lawyers and you don't, and your opponent's driving you out of the market with predatory pricing, chances are your cash flow is not going to support you to lawyer up. What you're going to play for there is if you can't get the law on your side, you can at least try for the ethical thing of repositioning yourself as the local business, small business. But you might also want to be watching on predatory pricing is an extended period of predatory pricing is going to reduce the reference price in the consumer's head. So when you want to go back to what you think the price should be, the consumer's not going to come with you. The consumer's not going to see it as good value anymore because you were so frequently putting it out at a massively discounted rate the customer changed their reference price down. Now you're putting it back at the rate you want. The customer thinks it's poor value. So as a marketer, I honestly think that the last thing you want to be doing as a marketer is predatory pricing because that is taking away price as a tool to communicate value and taking away the strength of your branding and your product positioning. And that is price. It is Slide-wise, light on, but the text is really, it's one of the most important chapters for the text to dominate. Read through the equations, look at the charts, look at the diagrams. It's one where you've really got to read it. From a marketer's perspective, your highlights package is the psychological issues and thinking now in terms of what role does price play when we come to talking about communication and we come to talk about branding and positioning. As always, if you need me, contact me via the platforms on the screen. Catch me on Twitter at Stephen Dan or send me an email, stephen.dan at anu.edu.au.